Oh. <laughs> but I put it in, the master still works, but the image doesn't work. So then I go back and image it again, same exact problem, still doesn't work. This one is not good. It's not good. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. I don't know. It's weird. The master again, and the master works. So. The master works? Yeah. You can see the master deep shot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Z chat and that's all. I think we're forgetting one little step. Something about the slide and the drive. It should be your the drive and it should be safe. I think that was one of the when you when you do this, this is not a drive and drive. That time is constant. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think it's just wrong pointing. It should have something to do with the back up. Maybe if you loop from that drive and then you get it out, do that one. That's good. I'll get me answer. Okay. And then start the image program out. What about when we start a computer again? Let's go to the same process that we did when we started. No, try to re-image it again. Oh, all right. Try to image it off with the master. Oh, with the master being the OS. I think that's actually how we set it wrong. I'll try that. Okay. How are you doing there, Eugene? What is good news for you right now? Is it campus surplus? Just kidding. Here we go. Yeah, so we start. It's okay. Should we start? You're, um, well, we're going to have to start this over. I was trying to record it and did something stupid. It's Okay. Um, our first speaker today is Zi Chao, and he received his BS degree and MS degree in electrical engineering, all from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2014 and 16, respectively. He is currently pursuing his PhD degree in electrical engineering, and his research interest is on flying capacitor, multi-level power converters with extreme power densities, with a focus on integrated gate drivers and single-stage buck PFC. All right, thank you, CC. Thank you, everyone, for coming to this seminar. Today, I'm going to talk about the design and implementation of a low-cost and compact floating gate drive power supply circuit for flying capacitor multi-level converters. <coughs> Here is a brief outline of my talk. I will start from the motivation. Here I'm showing a very simple four-level multi-level converter. This is actually not a new topology as being invented by well, 25, 30 years, but didn't gain much attention, primarily because it is very challenging to physically implement this. One of the reasons is, as you can see, there are a lot of floating uh, MOSFET in this topology, which means uh, we need a floating gate to source voltage to power, to turn on the switches. So the traditional way to do this is to use isolated uh, DC-DC power supplies. Um, but usually they are very bulky and inefficient. The state of art of the isolated DCD supply is the integrated one made by ADI, our group used for the little box uh, challenge, which is the green parts highlighting here. As you can see, there's still, although it's the comp most compact solutions so far, they're still much larger than the GAN switches and gate drivers. So that is the motivation of this work. We want to find some alternative ways to power these floating switches to achieve the same functionality as the isolated DC DC power supply did, but we have uh, we want them to have high efficiency, 
la uh, smaller footprint and lower cost. Maybe you could explain on the board what a floating switch is. Oh, floating switches means. And why it's a problem? Suppose this is a uh, n-type MOSFET. MOSFET. This is a gate terminal. This is a source terminal. To turn on the switch, we need a positive, like five volts, gate to source voltage to turn on this switch. But in this topology, as you can see, except this bottom switch, all of the top switches, the source terminal are not referenced to the ground. So which means we need to apply a VGS that is referenced to the source terminal, which is also floating, to control the switches. So we cannot use a uh, power supply with ground reference. That is impossible uh, for this topology. It's not working. Can't go to. Okay. So in this work, we proposed three methods to do the floating power supply work. And the cascaded bootstrap double charge pump that used to power the low size switches. Uh, uh, the low side means the switch is below the inductor. And the method called gate driven charge, charge pump to power the high size switches. By combining the three switch, uh, the three methods together, we are able to reduce the size of the power stage of this seven level converter by half from this rectangle to the middle of this. So we achieve 50% reduction by using these three methods. So let's start from the very basic. That's uh, to reduce the number of components. This is a uh, the, the technique we used in the little box challenge. We use half ridge gate drivers. Half ridge, half ridge gate driver is a chip that includes two smaller gate drivers in the single chip. So instead of using one gate driver for every single switch, every two switches only need one gate driver. So uh, with this topology, we reduce the number of gate driver by half. Uh, and more than that, since on, uh, one chip only needs one input power supply, and we also reduce the number of the isolated power supplies by half as well as the digital isolators. So let's take a deeper look into this uh, half bridge chip. Here is the input. This is the input capa uh, decoupling capacitor for the half bridge gate driver. And it is used to provide power for the low side uh, switch for each uh, half bridge, like M1, M3, and M5. For the high side of each half bridge gate driver, it is powered by a technique called uh, bootstrap. There is a diode, integrated diode in this uh, chip. Suppose the low side switch is on, this diode will conduct, and this capacitor can be used to charge the high side capacitor, which is in this circle, through this red loop. So that means we don't need to worry about the power supply for the high side uh, gate driver because of this very simple and convenient uh, bootstrap te technique. So we asked ourselves, can we ex expand this technique to a string of switches? Because the multi-level topology can be seen as a series connected, uh, a string of series connected switches. So can we just do this? To use a multiple uh, multiple dials to do the bootstrap uh, operation again and again. The answer is yes and uh, no. Uh, one of the reasons I say no is the dial has a certain forward voltage drop. By doing every bootstrap operation, we lose certain amount of voltage. So by doing this cascaded bootstrap again and again, we may lose uh, the, high, the end of the, this bootstrap chain will not have enough voltage. And also, because we use GAN switches, Compared to silicon, GAN switches has a very tight allowed gate voltage range. Essentially, we need a, a minimum 4.5 volts to turn on the switch, but it cannot go above 6 volts. If you go above 6 volts, you will destroy the device instantly. 
but we also see some hope because of certain characteristics of the GAN technology. The GAN, although the GAN fat doesn't have a body out, but it has a similar mechanism in reverse conduction mode. It has uh, actually a very large uh, voltage drop in the reverse conduction mode, as large as two volts. And we can use, utilize this special mechanism <clears throat> to do uh, some overcharge of the bootstrap operation. Let's take a look at the very basic operation of a half bridge, uh, of a two level buck converter. During the dead time, when both of the switches are off, the inductor current still needs to flow. The current path will be flowing from ground into this body dial of a low side switch and then go to switching node and go to your load. So that means this body dial will conduct. Since I just mentioned that this body dial again has a very large uh, reverse uh, voltage drop. So this switching node can be two volts lower than the ground potential. If we do a simple math, assuming this charge transfer is complete, the high side power supply capacitor, the C2, can be charged to 6.3 volts, assuming the low side voltage is 5 volts. So this is a overcharging mechanism happened during the dead time. So we see some hope. We might be able to use this special overcharging mechanism to charge the capacitor to higher and higher voltage. But in practice, there are a number of constraints. This overcharging mechanism depends on the direction of inductor, amplitude of load current, amount of gate drive power, as well as the length of diode. So this multi-level topology is very similar to the bar converter I just talked about. During that time, the inductor will flow in, in this direction, which means that only the capacitor of the low side switches and this, uh, the, the switch on top of the switching node, essentially C2 to C4, will see this overcharging mechanism. As you can see, Q1 has, the bottom power supply is five volts, Q2, Q3, and Q4 get overcharged, but not the high side switch, uh, Q5 and Q6. So that limits the range we can use for this method. And also, this method also depends on the uh, amplitude of the load current. So as you can see, although at high current, when the inductor current is one amp, you see a very obvious overcharging mechanism, the, the voltage becomes higher and higher. But if you see during the startup or light load, this overcharging mechanism is not very obvious, and you still suffer from this uh, forward voltage drop of the bootstrap diodes. Suppose if we have a lot of switches uh, connecting in series. During light load or startup, this voltage will drop, uh, keep drop, dropping to lower and lower value. And ultimately, some switches will have insufficient gate voltage and your circuit cannot start up. So that is another limitation of this method. Another one since, uh, is the dead time. Since this uh, overcharging mechanism only happens during the dead time, and uh, the length of the dead time will, uh, will determine how, uh, how high your voltage can be charged to. As you can see, with higher and higher that time, the capacitor can be charged to higher value. But as we know, uh, a very long that time is not very desirable for the overall operation of the power converter. It will uh, degrade the efficiency and it's not, <clears throat> and it's something we should uh, avoid. So we need to be careful about uh, this limitation and make sure uh, we achieve a good balance between the gate voltage we achieve and also the overall efficiency of the power converter. So there are a few li limitations of this method. But we don't give, want to give up. This is a quite simple uh, solution. If we do some modification, we can still get this work pretty good. So I, I propose a second method called double charge pump. Since the, current, uh, the existing problem we have now is the insufficient gate voltage uh, on certain switches during light load and startup, what if we can use a small, uh, simple circuit to provide a voltage that is high enough all the time? And we can do that with the uh, gate driver itself. Suppose this is a gate driver which involves an inverter inside. So there are two switches. 
uh, like an inverter. When the gate driver is pulled to low, the HO terminal is tied to ground. This capacitor C1 can be charged to the input of C boot through this loop. And when we pull this uh, gate driver high, this C1 will be essentially connected to the terminal HB. So C boot and the C1 are connected in series to form a, a 10 volts voltage so that the output can be charged to 10 volts. This is a quite simple circuit, only needs two diodes and two capacitors. And this is just the existing gate driver you have. So by doing this, we have 10 volts uh, to be bootstrap, and we don't need to worry about the voltage, voltage drop during the bootstrap operation anymore. But we don't get this for free, because ultimately after you do the bootstrap operation, the gate voltage has to be regulated to five or six volts by uh, LDO, otherwise it will break your circuit. So essentially this operation has only uh, has an efficiency of 50%. And if you want to do this over and over again, the efficiency will be 50% times 50% times 50%. You get lower and lower. And since this is a converter, you can see it cannot power ultimate high current. So if you do a lot of this operation again, you will not be able to get very high voltage to be bootstrap. That's the limitation of this uh, method. I come up with a third solution that is high efficient and can be compatible with the double charge pump. So this is totally different than the bootstrap operation I just uh, <coughs> talked about before. This is a completely new operation that is, can be used to charge a high side, capa uh, high side switch through a low side switch as long as they have a flying capacitor connected in, in between. This is the main flying capacitor in the topology, and we can charge a switch that is on top of this flying cap, which is Q5 in this case, from the low side switch Q3, which have a C fly in between. Through this, uh, through this loop I will talk about in a, in a minute. So, suppose, so we add three components, D1, D2, and C pump. When the gate driver of the switch Q3 is pulled to low to, low to its, its ground, the capacitor C pump will be charged to the value of the C fly in this red loop. And in the next <coughs> half cycle, when the gate terminal is put the high, this C pump and C3 will be connected in series and uh, will turn on the dial D1. So the capacitor C5 will be charged with the same voltage uh, of C3. Of course, there are, there are two dial, uh, dial, dial drop loss in this case, the drop of D1 and D2. Since these two dials only need to block the voltage of the only into block five volts voltage. This can be very small dialed and has very low voltage drop. So essentially in this operation, we may lose only 0.5 volts or less. And all of the high voltage is blocked by this C pump. The rating of the C pump is same as the rating of this C fly. So this method ha is very high, has a very high efficiency and also don't need, to, uh, uh, don't need to have a startup circuit. It can just start up itself. And also, this method can be used to other topologies as long as there is a flying cap uh, connected in between two, a high size switch and low size switch. So this is not limited to uh, multi-level convert topology only. A common question for this kind of uh, method is we use the gate terminal of the main MOSFET to do this energy transfer. Will this external circuit affect the normal operation of the main uh, GAN switch? And we did a very detailed analysis on this. And we find the answer is this charge pump will have no effect to the operation of the main switch. As you can see, there are four lines uh, in this term. The blue one is a reference 
curve without any gate-driven charge pump connected to the main switch. And there are three lines, and you, you can see essentially there is no effect to the, actually the red one has a little bit drop here, but the uh, green and the yellow one has uh, almost no effect to the uh, operation of the main switch. As long as we connect the gate-driven charge pump, the C pump, to the front side of the gate resistor. Okay, here is a complete solution for the seven level converter we have before. We have like, like the uh, converter we have for the little box challenge. So for this, uh, every two switches are powered by a half bridge gate driver. So as you can see uh, for the Q, Q, for the high side of each half bridge gate driver, Q2, Q4, Q6, they're all powered by traditional bootstrap the internal bootstrap dial. We don't need to do anything for these switches. And for the odd numbers, we first do a double charge pump for between these two half bridge, another double charge pump between these two half bridge, and the high side switches are powered by the gate driven charge pump. And all of these circuits have been built on this tiny switching cell. This is a switching cell, it has the same size as the original switching cell we have for the little bus challenge. But this is a, these are the GAN switches, the gate driver, and we just build the bootstrap, the double charge pump, the gate driven charge pump, and bootstrap the, the, the bootstrap dials all around the switching cell. So, so we can achieve a very good gate drive voltage for all of the switches. As you can see, the highest one is six volt, and the lowest one is 5.3 volts. This is primarily limited by the internal clamping of the gate driver chip. If I use another external dial to bypass that function, this uh, two voltage can be 5.6 or so. So that means all of the switches will have, uh, have a gate, gate drive voltage within 0.5 volts uh, difference. So that is similar to the half reach uh, and the Adam of the combination we have before. Here is the hardware prototype we built. It has essentially the same uh, design as the little box, but I just eliminate the isolated power supplies and make them build around the switching cells. And I put the digital isolator to the back side of the uh, back side of the board, right, <coughs> right beneath the switching cells. So with this kind of topology, we can shrink the size of the little box converter by 50% with the potential to output the same amount of power. And here is a table comparing the my work my work with the isolated DC DC chip. Essentially, I can do the same, achieve the same functionality with less parts, with smaller size, five times improvement, two times more uh, efficient, as well as six times reduction of the component cost. So here's a conclusion. In this work, we propose three combined techniques to provide the power to all of the floating gate drivers of the multi-level topology. You can achieve the same functionality, but with higher efficiency, lower cost, and smaller footprint. And that's uh, the end of my talk. Thank you everyone for your attention. <laughs> Any questions? Yes? So what is the current power level of the product? Uh, so first of all, the power level of the converter is not related to the gate drive circuit. For this, uh, for this, it's not working. For this converter, I can achieve, I test it up to 300 watts, 250 watts, 250 volts to 100 volts, 300 watts. But you can, you can do as good as the little box do. That's, yeah. Uh, professor? 
Uh, I'm not sure about the exact. You mean who wants to turn this into a commercial product? Of course, TI can do the ICs. Whichever company wants to make money, they can use my. <laughs> 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 I think TI is the biggest producer. You have any suggestions I should contact? Mara? I mean, what about the companies that make the ice layers? Yeah, Okay. Chris? Yeah, Chris. Yes. Um, is startup the same as any other flying capacitor? Or <coughs> uh, it can start up itself. Yes. Essentially, you when this switch is on, you can charge this capacitor. When this switch is on, you can charge this capacitor. You can charge it one by one. For a gauge room charge pump, it's a little bit different, but it's, you, you can. I, I, I thought you said that. I just want to make sure. Like, it's really okay. Okay. So when you turn on the control power, do all the gates start switching on their own? Yes. As you can see, for this table, this is no way in just a control power. You don't need to connect the input power. You can. So the reason I use a very high supply voltage is I want to make sure in the worst case, there is still 4.5 volts to fully enhance the switch. If I compromise a little bit, I can use less supply voltage to lower the loss. No more questions? OK, thank you again for attention. Okay, thanks, CC. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, today, the topic I'm going to talk about is on the value of communication links in voltage bar control for distribution networks, a game theoretic perspective. So, for, sorry, first, a little bit background of the problem. Uh, we all know that the functionality of the distribution system is to deliver power from the feeder, okay. the feeder here to various loads. And uh, during this process, the voltage level is Usually, monotonically decreasing from the feeder, and sometimes it may even fall below uh, a required limit for a healthy voltage level. So uh, one has to regulate the voltage level to be within a certain uh, certain range. For example, from the uh, 0 0.95 to 1.05 uh, per unit. So there has been several traditional ways of doing that. For example, one can use uh, one can tune the um, tap ratio at the transform transformers, or use some voltage regulators to do that. However, these traditional ways only work at a relatively low time scale. Are you a question? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. This is this is a typical. This is an example of a typical distribution system, and this is a feeder. And this is like the horizontal. The the axis is the is a network. 
it go, go down from, this is the upper stream of the network, and these are like the downstream of the network. So the voltage is decreasing. And you can boost the voltage level at a certain point using some uh, like transformer or voltage regulators, but they only work at a relatively uh, slow time scale, and uh, which makes them ineffective in the current distribution systems, especially with the high penetration of distributed energy sources, we call DRs, including the electric vehicle uh, batteries or like PV panels. They pose great challenges for voltage regulation because they are highly variable and unpredictable. And they will bring about uh, very, far, very fast transient fluctuations of voltage in the system. However, if we can make appropriate use of these DRs, we can actually, uh, they can actually be helpful to do the voltage regulation. The, uh, in fact, with the uh, development of power electronics, uh, these DRs can easily inject uh, reactive power into the system, as shown here, to boost the voltage even at the very end of the network. So this brings about the problem we are going to investigate called voltage VAR control. We want to decide the optimal reactive power, the VAR support for the system from the DRs to do the voltage regulation as best as they can. So there has been several related works in this area. Uh, one basic idea is to do called local or droop control. So they decide, they decide the uh, VAR injection following a linear or piecewise linear function of the uh, voltage mismatch as shown here. So, however, several, uh, several works have shown that this local control uh, scheme suffer from a system level suboptimality, sub especially with limited bar resources, which is almost always the case in practice. This, always, uh, this also makes sense because these are just like myopic uh, local decisions. Therefore, it should be better to coordinate these DRs uh, via communications. So there uh, has been another line of works called the optimal power flow based control. They formulate this problem as an optimization problem and try to solve it either centrally, using a centralized solver, or distributedly. Uh, however, for the central solver, you need to know the full network information to solve it, which is really not the case. Uh, in the real system for, for, for any of the bus to know the uh, full network information. And for the distributed voltage control algorithms, they assume that each bus has to uh, be able to communicate with at least their one-hop neighbors in some sense, for, ex for example, in probability. So this figure better illustrates the differences of these three paradigms. The first one is the first one is called the local one. They take local measurements and make local decisions. And the second one is called the centralized one. There is a central controller in charge of all the buses. And the third one is the distributed one. However, the fact is that in the current distribution systems, the communication inf infrastructure is very limited and of low quality, which makes some of this algorithm even not implementable. So this, bring, bring about, this brings about our focus on this problem. We tentatively call it semi-local uh, voltage, uh, semi voltage control. We call it semi-local because it lies between the fully local one and the OPF one. And we are considering such a cyber physical system. It has two layers. The uh, physical layer is just the uh, power distribution network. So it's just a bunch of buses connected to each other. And on top of that, we have a cyber layer, which allows some of the buses to be able to communicate with some others. However, different from the previous ones, we do not assume this network is strongly connected, meaning that sometimes these buses may be partitioned into different clusters, or we, call, we are going to call it component, and the buses can only communicate with the buses within that component. So we are uh, interested in answering the uh, the following questions under this paradigm. The first question is, what system may, uh, will end up being under this paradigm? Meaning that how can we characterize the equilibrium of this voltage bar control with such scarce communication links? And after that, we want to design an algorithm that respects these communication limitations to achieve this equilibrium. And the third one, uh, also, the ultimate goal of the, of the work is to try to find an optimal way to deploy the communication links that can maximally improve the system performance. We are going to answer these questions one by one. 
So to start with, we uh, introduced, introduced the modeling for the uh, power network first. This is just a, distri uh, this is a distribution network. We consider it as a tree topology. The bus zero here is what we call feeder. And uh, we use the Lindis power flow model and we write it out as a, in a more compact form. And the uh, uh, capital P here is captures the uh, branch real power. And the small p here is the vector of uh, real power injection. And the same convention holds for the Q here. And the V is the vector of uh, uh, voltage magnitude at, at all the buses. And the DR and DX captures the line reactance and resistance of the system. And uh, uh, although this is a, this is a linearized uh, power flow model, although this is just an approximation, its effectiveness has been validated in a bunch of works. So let's stick to this model so far in our work. And by manipulating that linear equations, linear power flows, we obtain the relationship between the uh, var injection Q and the, and the uh, voltage magni magnitude V. And uh, we finally arrive at this important relation. V is equal to X Q plus V bar. The V bar here is just a, a constant vector that captures operating point of the system, which is determined by the real power injection P and the, the uh, voltage level at the feeder V0 and all the other parameters of the, uh, of the system. And uh, we have a very uh, nice property. The, uh, we have a lemma to show the nice property of this matrix X, showing that the matrix S is actually a positive de definite matrix with non-negative entries. And we will heavily rely on this conclusion in the following analysis. So we follow the OPF based approach first. We formulate the voltage control problem as a DC OPF. We denote it as P0. The objective is to minimize the uh, operational cost, which consists of two parts. The first part is the voltage mismatch. The mu here is the, is the desired voltage profile. And the second part is the, we call the cost of VAR uh, provision because the, the VAR injection does not come, from, come for free and subject to the uh, linear power flow and this uh, limitation on the VAR resources, which accounts for the uh, rating limits of the inverter. So this is a very simple model. And uh, this is a problem, the original problem we want to solve. Besides the uh, model, after the modeling for the power side, we consider a communication graph which consists of K connected components. And because there is no information allowed uh, between these connected components, each bus can only take care of the operational point within that component. Although they are physically connected to each other, their decisions will have impact on others' operational cost. This naturally makes us to uh, form this problem as a strategic game, which can be uh, described as this tuple, tuple here. It consists of K players. Each player corresponds to one uh, component. And each of the players has uh, an action set, which is just the feasible VAR injection set. It's a box described here by uh, capital QK. And we also define the payout function for each player, which is just the uh, operational cost for that specific component K. Also two, two, uh, two parts the voltage mismatch and the VAR provision cost. If we expand the expression for this VK following that linear relationship, we can get the uh, expression for this payoff function. Uh, we can see that UK is not only a function of the, its local, its own um, VAR injection QK, but also a function of Q minus K, which is a VAR injection of all the other connected components. And X here are the block sub matrix of the X matrix. And the mu k here is just a constant. So now we are ready to characterize the equilibrium of this problem. We uh, use the definition of Nash equilibrium as defined here, meaning that this actually means that uh, at the equilibrium, none of the players is, I mean, has the motivation to deviate from this uh, from this equilibrium. It's the best choice he can, uh, he or she can make. 
uh, given all the other strategies. So uh, note that the submatrix SKK is uh, positive definite because X is positive definite. And also because the capital QK is convex and compact, we have the following conclusion showing that there always exists such an equilibrium for our game. And also because as we, uh, we can observe here, this is just uh, given all the other strategies. This is just a quadratic function of QK. Therefore, each of the subproblem is just a quadratic programming over QK. So we can write out the optimality condition, which is the KT condition uh, for each subproblem and combine them together to get the conditions that characterize this equilibrium. We call it equilibrium condition, BC. And if we uh, denote X theta to be the uh, diag uh, block diagonal matrix with XKK on its diagonal, we can write out this EC in a more compact form. So take a look at this form. If you are familiar with the convex optimization, this, is, this looks very similar to the KT condition of some um, optimization problem. The first term is, uh, the first equation comes from the, if you take the derivative of the Lagrange function and uh, let it to be zero. And these two are just the um, complementary slackness conditions. And these are just the constraints for the pr uh, primal and dual variables. However, the key difference here is that uh, because this is a game, this matrix x theta x is no longer symmetric. So this is, this is not this is not a KD condition, although it looks very similar. And we will show later that the property of this equilibrium is strongly dependent on the property of this matrix. The matrix right, right before uh, the variable Q, which is x theta x plus C. So uh, after the existence of the equilibrium, we also investigate the uniqueness of the equilibrium. We have such a proposition showing that uh, this equilibrium is unique for any operating point mu bar if and only if the matrix x theta x is a P matrix, meaning that all its principal manner is positive. I want to emphasize that the reason why we want to make the condition to uh, hold for any C because, uh, because first of all, the, the C is related to the cost of bar injection, which is kind of difficult to justify its value in practice. And also we are more interested in how the uh, communication topology captured by X theta and how the setup of the power network captured by X impact this uh, uniqueness. So we want the condition to be irrelevant to the choice of C. And this proof stems from the theory of linear complementarity problem and we extend their, some of their results to prove this proposition. And also we can show that for some, specific, uh, for some special distribution networks, uh, this P property of X theta and X always holds. For example, if the power network, the distribution network is just one line as shown here, meaning that each bus on this network has degree no greater than two, then this matrix, no matter how you uh, choose the communication topology, how you partition these buses, this matrix is always positive, uh, a P matrix, which leads to the uniqueness of this equilibrium. And however, in general, this P property is not easy to verify. You have to check out all the principal manners. So we uh, give another proposition, which is uh, just a sufficient condition for the equilibrium, meaning uh, showing that the, if the, this matrix, the x theta x is positive definite, then this equilibrium is uh, unique. And this proposition is also, uh, important also because it will play a role in the design of the algorithm. However, in general, this matrix is not provably to be a P matrix or PD matrix. However, the uniqueness is not a big concern in practice because of the following observations. Um, the first is that, note that although this proposition too is the if and only if condition, it's very strong, but it, uh, it says it holds for mm. all the operating point. However, for, uh, for a real system, the actual operating point mu bar does not necessarily lead to multiple equilibrium. And also, in uh, a lot of our, our simulation cases, this matrix X theta X is indeed a P matrix. And even if it is not, uh, a very small C usually suffices, suffices to make X theta X plus C a P matrix or PD matrix, 
which leads to the uniqueness of this equilibrium. That's pretty much what we can say in general about this equilibrium. And we also investigate two interesting, uh, interesting special cases that can provide more insights on the value of communication links. We first consider a special case where there's no communication at all. Then we showed in this uh, theorem that the equilibrium of the, uh, in this case is equivalent to the solution to a convex optimization problem P1 here. Interestingly, if we compare this P1 with original P0, they have the same uh, constraint. But the, this, is, this, uh, this P1 has a weighted uh, objective. So, and also because this is a solution to a convex optimization, this is, uh, equilibrium is unique. Um, this can be proved by showing the EC and the optimality condition for P1 are equivalent. And also it directly comes from the proposition two because X to the X can be proved to be a P matrix in this case. And more importantly, the value of communications can be viewed by, uh, can be captured by comparing the solution to this P1 and the original problem P0. And also we made several observations in this case. First is that the, uh, in this case, the solution to the P1 usually has less magnitude uh, in Q, meaning that the buses are becoming selfish and they are less likely to contribute more resources into the system compared to the optimal one, if they, uh, if they cannot communicate with each other. And also, interestingly, the, the objective of this function, of this problem, happens to be the weighted potential function of this game, which bring about some uh, nice properties of a potential games. And also, we, uh, in the proof of this theorem, we observe that this uh, EC is invariant up to a positive definite diagonal matrix scaling. And therefore, we have another corollary, which is uh, another sufficient condition for the uniqueness of this uh, equilibrium. And interestingly, this diagonal stability has been investigated in control society. It's related to the, uh, to the solution of the Lyapunov equation. So there has been some results we can use to, as a, uh, use, use, we can use as a condition for the uniqueness. This is a very, very interesting connection. And the second case is that is when we place communication links among the buses that have the that are in the same situation. So in this theorem, we show that if we uh, if this assumption holds, then the solution to that P1, uh, if they if the solution makes the buses within one communication component has the same bar injection situation, then this is one equilibrium of the game. So by saying var injection situation, we are talking about whether this var injection is touching the upper limit, the lower limit, or touch no limit. So it can also be proved by showing the uh, equivalence of the conditions. And the interesting observation is that if we set C to zero, then this equilibrium is the same as, as the equilibrium in case one, meaning that although we allow communication links to be placed in this case, it gains no benefits if we place, the, uh, place them uh, among the buses that are already in the same situation. This implies that the value of communication links is for each bus is to uh, provide a way for them to ask help from other buses that may have abundant bar resources. So that's pretty much the answer to the first question. And to achieve that equilibrium, we want to design a voltage regulation algorithm that is easy to implement. So we resort to the gradient projection based algorithm. However, since this is a game, we don't have even have a, an objective function. So we don't call it gradient. We have a called pseudo gradient here, which is basically the um, gradient of each uh, payoff function with respect to, its, to each player's decision variable QK. If we take a look at this term, this is XQ, X is the Usually a dense matrix, so it's involved to uh, evaluate this pseudo gradient. But we can write it as this way: it can be expressed as a function of the uh, voltage mismatch, which can be measured locally. This is a key of this algorithm. This relationship shows that the up-to-date information on other components bar injection Q minus K is reflected in the measurements V K. So because there is no communication among the components, a synchronized update is necessary. 
So we propose such an update. The capital T here is that it collects the iterations when an update is execute, uh, executed. If T is in that set, then the, it will do one step pro, uh, grid, uh, gradient projection. The epsilon is a step, step size, and this is a projection onto this uh, feasible set. And if it's not, it will just stay the same. And we have a pro proposition to show that this uh, asynchronized update uh, with bounded update delays converges to the unique equilibrium if this matrix is positive definite, which we have shown in the uh, proposition four, if the step size is small enough. So uh, we have done some, uh, some simulation works on this algorithm. We, con we are considering a radio network with 13 buses and the uni uh, uniform impedance. The, the blue lines are the uh, distribution networks and the red lines are the communication networks. We can see that there are like eight communication components in this case. And if we calculate the uh, smallest eigenvalue of this matrix, it's, it's negative, but it has very small magnitude. And also if we test the, all the principal manners of this matrix, it is indeed a P matrix, meaning that uh, the equilibrium in this case is unique. And we uh, by choosing different C here, we can make this matrix indefinite or positive definite. And we test our algorithm on both cases. If this matrix, if we choose C to be large enough to make this, uh, this matrix a positive definite matrix, then as we have proved, this algorithm will work very well. So no matter how you choose the uh, time delay, it will converge to the Nash equilibrium. And also, we can observe here that there is an efficiency loss between the equilibrium and the optimal uh, operational cost. And this efficiency loss actually comes from the, for, for lack of communication. And the right-hand side is the uh, mismatch from the optimal Q. We can see that also uh, this algorithm converges to the real Nash equilibrium. And also, although we cannot prove in this case, but because the equilibrium is unique, we show that the algorithm also works. Although it takes longer to converge, but it will converge to the uh, unique equilibrium. Also, there's a, also an efficiency loss about 18%. So that's about the question to the second problem. So the ultimate goal is to uh, find a way to optimally deploy communication links Meaning that what we have done before is that given the communication topology uh, described by the X-tilde, we can characterize its equilibrium. And now we want to find the optimal X-tilde. We want to design optimal X-tilde. So we can uh, formulate this problem, deployment problem, as a bilevel optimization problem. Basically, on the lower level, it's just what we have done. It's a equilibrium. It's a equilibrium, and we calculate them using the ECs, and we put them as the constraints. And the, the, on the upper level, we want to minimize this uh, operational cost. And the S here is the selection vector. Basically, uh, the S here determines how the X tilde or how the communication topology looks like. However, this bilevel problem is difficult to solve because we have the equilibrium conditions as constraints. So we, can, we only have some uh, numerical results so far. So we can show that. In some cases, um, it is, it's a very interesting observation that it's not always beneficial to add communication links into the system. Uh, this can happen in the case where if there are some uh, conflict of interest among the different groups of buses, meaning that if some groups think uh, it's better for them to inject VAR into the system, while some others think it's better to uh, absorb VAR, then if you place a link in between, it will even degrade the system performance. And in another case study, we show the, uh, we show the sequence of link placement of two algorithms, the optimal one. We enumerate all the possible cases for this small case. And also, we use a gradient deployment. So can you click on that? It's a video. Yeah, 
Screen grid. So this shows how the link is placed in this parameter. You can show that the sequence is kind of different, but they, uh, but in terms of the operational cost, uh, they two looks very, I mean, the, the gradient algorithm is not so bad. So that's what we have for the numerical test for this uh, problem. So to, uh, to sum up, we have characterized the equilibrium of the voltage control bar control problem under limited communications from a game per, uh, theoretic perspective. And then we analyze the Nash equilibrium and uh, investigate its general existence and uniqueness conditions. And then we make connections between the equilibrium and a convex optimization problem in two special cases. And we provide some insights on the value of communications in these two special cases. And then we develop a, a synchronized uh, control algorithm that respects its communication limitations. And then we propose a bilevel optimization problem and provide some preliminary simulation results. And one important next step is to try to handle this uh, bilevel problem by approximation or relaxation and try to solve it. And uh, that's all I have. Thanks. Okay, so yeah, okay, good question. I'll explain it. So the efficiency loss here means that the difference between the uh, between the, 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 I mean, the, the, the value of the operational cost, the difference between the equilibrium one and the optimal one. So we want to minimize the operational cost of this system in our voltage control problem. So we have an optimal solution. And however, without communication or for lack of communications, uh, each of the players and the players will achieve an equilibrium. That equilibrium is, in most cases, inefficient. Meaning that uh, because they are not the solution to that optimization problem. So there will be a gap in between. And uh, the gap here is a bad thing. Meaning that the, the, because of the lack of uh, communication, because of the lack of uh, information exchange, we have such a loss. So it's a bad thing. So, so what's the benefit of your approach if you have to have a 47% loss? Uh, no, actually, we, we, we do not try to, we are not trying to uh, develop an algorithm to overcome this, uh, overcome this, uh, this efficiency loss. We want, we, want to, we want to see what would happen if uh, there is not enough communications. And we have shown that the, uh, this equilibrium is, I mean, it will have uh, an efficiency loss in this case. But we haven't, and also we found an algorithm to achieve that equilibrium. But we don't, uh, we haven't found a way to overcome that. It's not a thing that we want to overcome. It's just the phenomenon is what the system would be like and what the equilibrium would be like if there's not enough communications. And in the third part, we want to find an optimal way to place the links so that presumably if you add more links into a system, it should be better. If you add, uh, allow more buses to coordinate with, with each other, it should be better. That's the thing we want to do in the third part. But we haven't done any theoretical result. Have, haven't got any theoretical result in that part. Yeah. So, do you think that what you have done here will be translated to having a new practice for the solution system? Um. Yeah. Good question. In the previous two parts, I think that's just more like a characterization characterization of the equilibrium. And uh, so that, that's the reason why I said the third part is the most important part. Because the third part can help us to do planning, where to uh, construct or establish such a communication link. If we can figure out uh, where to put it is the most uh, beneficial choice. If we can figure that out, we can do that. And it, that can be very helpful in uh, planning communication <laughs> infrastructures, for example. I think that's the most practical one. Yeah. 
Um, I think probably the utility, the who are who is in charge of the uh, whole distribution system, who wants uh, who who uh, who are aiming for a system level optimality, not instead of the uh, instead of the the, the equilibrium, who wants the system overall to be better. That that guy should pay for this communication infrastructure. Try to coordinate the DRs to to uh, make benefits. Yes, yes, they are installed by the homeowners. But in order to coordinate them, you need a, uh, I mean, a people who is in charge, who are in charge of all the DRs. The overall distribution system should be responsible for this, for constructing this infrastructure. I think. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so this is just an algorithm. It's a gradient projection uh, based algorithm. Actually, um, the convergence rate of this uh, gradient algorithm it, it's it's linear. Optimal is linear. It uh, and in, in general cases it could be sublinear, but the optimal is linear. And this is a log logarithm uh, plot. So this here actually at the very beginning is just the initialization of this algorithm. And then it will converge at a rate of a linear rate. That is what is showing here. And the slope is different because we have different uh, delay, bound for the delay. Because we, have, uh, we, are, we are using the asynchronous update, meaning that uh, all the players update, they, they are not updated at the same time. So some are faster and some are slower. And if, if we, uh, and past, we assume that uh, there is, all, uh, I mean, each, each player has to update at least every big T iterations. So if the T is large, meaning that it will, it will uh, take a longer time to update for another time. So it will convert slower. Yeah, that's how this curve look, look, why this curve looks like this. It's just the property of this gradient algorithm. Mm -hmm. 